Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, there are a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update to the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, sessions F and H, on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADC, GADMCONF in your posts about the conference on social media to help spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Hao Rei Wu, an assistant professor at Dalhousie University in Canada with a passion for community-based interdisciplinary research on resilience. He is with us today to discuss promoting companion animal guardians with disabilities access to veterinary, medical, and behavioral services during COVID-19. How, Ray? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Hao Rei. I'm the current Canada Research Chair in Disaster and Resilience. And also, I'm a social worker and disaster responder. So part of my research focuses on human-animal interactions in the global context of climate change and disaster. Today, I would like to share one of the projects conducting during the COVID-19, concentrating on a very special animal guardian's access to veterinary service namely people with disability. This project was funded by Social Science and the Humanities Research Council of Canada. First, I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the campus of their Hosea University, located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Furthermore, African Nova Scotians has also enriched this land for over 400 years. Both indigenous and African Canadians are essential in my research. I think we all heard this news. Since the onset of COVID-19 in March 2020, companion animals guardianship has dramatically increased worldwide. So in Canada, 18% reported that they obtained a new pet since the start of the pandemic. And the pets have provided real help at the individual level. These small animals helped combine loneliness and isolation. At a family level, pets support homeschooling and the network working at home. And at a community level, Working dogs has been an essential activity permanent during the COVID-19 lockdown, making it the only socializing for many community members. So pets support human health and well-being. But when our furry family members got sick during the COVID, could they be easily take care? We all understand that COVID-19 affects uh, almost all dimensions in our society, right? This image shows some of the major concern. At the individual level, 
a lot of people has experienced the economic hardship due to loss of job or other type of unemployment. So in order to help this type of animal owners, my research partner, the Vancouver Humane Society, developed the COVID-19 emergency funds to help low-income pet guardians to pay their veterinary bills. Since human and animal welfare are interconnected, we hope those small funds could release some economic challenge for those people and eventually support animal and human welfare together. So with the unfolding of the COVID-19, public health mitigation strategies, supply chain disruptions, lockdown policies, and shortage of veterinary professionals all made a lot of veterinary clinics overwhelmed. So a lot of veterinary clinics did not take any new patients or even closed. With all those different challenges combined together with triggered compounded influence, we realized that maybe those small funds may not help the past guardians a lot. Then in order to further help, her, help them, we need to understand their full spectrum of challenges so that we can develop special program to address their special needs. So we developed this project to qualitatively understand the animal guardian's challenges to access medical, uh, veterinary medical service during the COVID. Collaborating with uh, Vancouver Human Society's VHS here, this qualitative study focused on the Metro Vancouver area, the major service area of VG, VHS. VHS provides us a long list of contact information of people who received the companion animal veterinary emergency funds. We send our interview intervention to all those people, and the first 12 people who agreed to participate were invited for an one-to-one -one interview. We use a phenomenological approach to analyze the interview transcript. This table shows the demographic information of the 12 participants. So during the um, participant recruitment stage, disabilities was not a inclusion or exclusion criteria. When we completed the interview among the 12 participants, eight of them self-identified as people with disability. And the rest of them also mentioned some disabilities, including physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities. So when we get into the first round deductive data analysis, two of my team members analyzed the 12 transcript independently. And they discovered that disabilities emerged as one of the primary categories. Since my team members are all social workers, their professional sensitivities encourage them to apply the disability lens to re-examine the interview transcript using an inductive approach. Then we develop this code and the same structure to conceptualize the, our findings. So the three circles here, affordability, feasibility, and accessibility, <coughs> excuse me, demonstrate the three themes that emerged in the data analysis regarding the past owner's access to veterinary service during the first lockdown of the COVID-19. Under each theme, three level subcategories were developed to provide detailed supportive information, namely at the individual level, <coughs> sorry about that, <coughs> means um, people with disabilities and the social service level and also the veterinary service level. Each sub themes was followed by different codes and the, which were used to identify related information from the interview transcript. Now let me to show your details information about our findings. 
The first theme focuses on affordability for veterinary care. Uh, people with disabilities shows at least 2.5 times lower income than their non-disabled peers. So this background information really need us to think about the low income status for those people is a barrier for them to fulfill their living requirements. So they may not have extra money to pay the veterinary service. So this is a one quote from the participant, and she needs to ask several of her friends to get loan to pay the veterinary bills. And then when we move to the social service level, in Canada, the people living with disability receive some type of uh, assistance. However, Sorry about that. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, when the COVID-19 happens, a lot of service has already shut down or discontinued. So the people, the participant told us that it's very easy for them to get food from the food banks and including the food for their pets. But they need to pray that they, the pets will not get sick because if the pets get sick, they cannot pay anything for them. And also when we move to the veterinary service level, due to the public health requirements, veterinary teams could only uh, uh, communicate with the clients by phone, right? And the participant feel that it was not clear for them to totally understand the treatment plan and the details in the bills. And also the other things is that the veterinary team is also very, it's, a shot of professionals. So they, may, they might not be a person to explain those things, treatment plan and bills to the um, clients. And then one participant mentioned that if there is any flexibility for them to pay the bill, that is a really helped. How, unfortunately, this option is not, was not available at that time when our project was conducted. So affordability prevent most of companion animal guardians with abilities to access to veterinary service. And then reduced affordability pushed the companion animal guardians to pursue various assistance programs, especially those offered by the local animal protection organizations. At the individual level, one participant shared her story after successfully re re securing some funds from the local organization. And she suggests that people need to search all the related information and get any resources they can get. And some participant also said that when they got those information, they shared with others. It's really a peer support environment feel, make us feel very, very warm. However, please note that feasibility to obtain this assistant information for people with disability might be lower than their non-disabled peers due to some very specific challenges, such as physical challenges and cognitive challenges. So people living with disability may not be able to effectively use computer to search online. And those type of special requirements was largely neglected. And then move to the social service level, the COVID-19 triggers economic influence. It's also reduced the non-perfect organization's capacity to offer animal assistance programs, right? And the one participant expressed the frustration when calling different agencies and discovered that the continuous response was, we don't have any funds at this moment. So when we move to the veterinary care level, as, as I mentioned before, a lot of veterinary clinics did not take any new patients or close their door during the shutdown it was very easy for you to find available veterinary service before COVID, but
but during COVID, it might not be the same case. Participants indicate that due to their disabilities, the emergency care they contact were not available, and only SPCA affiliate clinics was opened at these participants identified. So feasibility to receive help prevents the companion animal guardians with disabilities to access to veterinary care. That is the second reason. When you get money to pay the bill and fund available animal hospitals, then going there was not very easy either during the COVID. People with disabilities may experience chronic health conditions, which correlate to the decreased immune systems. So during the pandemic, accessing safe public service triggered deep individual concern associated with the physical health and mental wellness. Responding to the COVID-19 driven public health safety measures, public transportation reduced their operation times, frequency and passage, passenger capacity. This reduced service resulting long waiting times and tiresome rules for the companion animal guardians to communicate with uh, their animal to veterinary clinic. And then at a veterinary level, we know that curbside service was developed during the COVID. It's really promising. However, the participant mentioned that they also experience emotional challenge for using the curbside service because they cannot go into the clinic with their animals. So affordability are the third major reason preventing them to access to veterinary service. One health and welfare, uh, one welfare framework indicate that human and animal health and well-being are interconnected. We also know that very unique relationship between people with disability and their animals. Affordability, feasibility, and accessibility are the pr three principal barriers indicated in this research. These three barriers reflect the people with disabilities unique requirement has been largely overlooked during the COVID-19. The complexity associated with this barrier illustrates the root causes of social justice and social injustice that intensified during the pandemic. Recognizing the evidence-based challenges of this specific group can inform the public, private, and non-for-perfect sectors to improve their existing service or programs or to develop new strategies to address uh, their unique requirements. For instance, the barriers that people living with disability faced in applying for the COVID-19 specific financial support could be removed. And furthermore, veterinary clinics might provide some payment flexibilities or other possible support to increase affordability for veterinary service. Promoting the um, people with disabilities access to the appropriate assistance and support programs could reduce the feasibility barriers. Community-based service agency could promote their cross-institutional cooperation by coordinating their different resources and networks for information dissemination and co-design some collaborative programs to support these special groups. And neighborhood-based support programs such as Carpool and the Right Shares would enable the people to arrive at a veterinary clinic safely and effectively. So by the end of this presentation, I would like to mention that COVID-19 is one type of disaster. With the uh, accelerated climate change, another public health emergency might occur in the next minutes. And other disaster type, like a uh, last presenter mentioned about earthquake, flood, hurricanes, that destroyed our built environment also affect uh, both human and animals. So we need to develop the people with disability driven service program. However, people with disability is only one type of vulnerable populations. We do have other types such as older adults, 
children and youth, immigrants and refugees. All those people need special requirements and special support. So moving beyond the COVID and the people with disabilities, we need to develop other specific service program to support other vulnerable pets guardians in order to promote human animal welfare. Thank you so much for your attention and please feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Do we have, do any of our participants have questions for how right? I think we appreciate you pulling together information on such a deeply affected segment of, as, as we were all affected by COVID, this group. That's right, thank you. Especially needing resources. Mm -hmm. Kelly does ask, did your research include any homeless people and their pets and needs? Okay, that is a really, really great question. I would like to mention one thing is that when we're talking about the vulnerabilities of vulnerable populations, there are so many different types. From the research perspective, we are trying to separate them and target their needs. However, we understand some people are really combined different type of vulnerabilities. So for example, you mentioned about people experiencing homelessness. According to my previous research, I have so many participants from this group experiencing low income, second, disability, and then they might from ethnic minority groups or sexual and gender minority groups and the immigrants and refugee groups. All those type of vulnerabilities will trigger compound influence affect their access to the veterinary service. So from this research project, unfortunately there is no people uh, self-identify as their, their homeless population. However, I have different project target a homeless population. How can we support people experience homelessness in disaster settings? So you might have heard about like in Nova Scotia, there was a big fires in the uh, Nova Scotians history in the past 30 years. It's affect homeless population. And then from the interview, I conduct with homeless people and those, almost everyone mentioned that if I have one piece of meal, I will give to my dog. If I have one sense, I will buy something for my pets. So those people always uh, give the top priority to their animals. So this is really moving story. And from the service uh, program developer perspective or social worker perspective, perspective, I would be very happy to help them to connect them to different community-based resources to support them during the disaster setting. We don't want an animal be starved. And also we don't want the people to get affected. So that is why we are trying to support them and support human animal interaction or human animal welfare together. Thank you. Thank you. We did have another question as an academic, what scholars around resilience did you find useful in your study? Um, okay, so resilience is a really an uh, interdisciplinary field, right? When we're talking about resilience, the, the most, the top things we, also, we always focus on is uh, vulnerability reduction. How can we develop the, uh, how can we reduce different vulnerabilities? Reduce the vulnerabilities directly contribute to building resilience. So in that case, in my team, I have a multidisciplinary team. I have uh, architect and urban planners and civil engineers. They are addressing the vulnerability from the built environment. I have social science teams like the geography, social worker and sociology, economics. They develop the program to focus on the social vulnerability or societal related vulnerabilities. I also have a health team 
like uh, medical professionals and public health professionals, they developed the strategies to develop the uh, to reduce the health and well-being related uh, vulnerabilities. Actually, if we want to build resilience, we need to combine all those different dimensions together. So we really need an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach to do that. So I saw that this is a really a tendency in the future and uh, scholars have already crossed the boundary to collaborate with each other to contribute to building resilience. And I would like to see that this type of collaboration are increasing in the near future. And if you are really in, interested in this field, I would be very happy to collaborate with you and we can collaborate together to contribute to the building resilience for human animal welfare. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm sure you will be hearing from the person who asked that. 